There's our second scripture lesson, um, and also, uh, just Paula, I wonder that we have activity packs in the, the oh, we got them. Great. Just making sure. I am sometimes accused of being a micromanager, but <laughs> <laughs> just got to make sure everybody's okay. <laughs> Our second scripture lesson comes from Peter's second letter to the church. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while we are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. And we pray God's blessing on reading of this word. <clears throat> so, you know, I've, I've told you before how challenging it is to come up with a title for a sermon, because it has to be ready in time, you know, for those who are working on the bulletin. And it isn't until I kind of finish everything up that I really think of the title. So, the title, The Gift and Work of Peace, sounds rather banal or pedestrian. Uh, so I hope it is more exciting than it sounds. <laughs> so, because we're dealing uh, with a very profound topic, we ask the Lord's blessing, and we pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable this day to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, I found myself echoing Jeremiah this morning. <clears throat> Acting as the spokesperson for God, he accuses the nation's leaders of crying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Peace is a very difficult topic to address from the pulpit. The temptation for pastors is to spiritualize it, limiting it to the inner peace, uh, our inner peace, so that it becomes kind of a me and Jesus kind of thing. But my ancestors, that date back three or more centuries, right down to my grandparents and my parents, Mennonites, took Jesus' Sermon on the Mount seriously and literally. When he said, turn the other cheek, they did so literally being opposed to the taking of life, of human life, in any form, in any circumstances. As a result, they moved, they started in what we would call the lowlands of Europe, that would be areas that include Holland and Belgium now. Uh, Friesland was one of the areas. So they moved they, from there in the 16th century, then to Prussia, then to Ukraine, and then to Canada. 
Some of them have even moved out of Canada to Mexico or Belize and then back to Canada, some to Nova Scotia. They moved, they were on this journey to escape bearing arms, being forced to, bury, to bear arms or to enroll in the military by the governments of the countries that they lived in. They believed that to be faithful to Jesus Christ, they were called to break the cycle of violence, whether in personal relationships or between nations. Now, many faithful Christians hold varying views on this topic, so I know, I mean, I've experienced that for sure, but it does merit, merit serious conversation, in my opinion. In our scripture lessons this morning, the authors, <coughs> Isaiah and Peter, address peace on both the personal and the national level. In our Isaiah text, the prophet describes a future time when God will come in power and gentleness. Notice that uh, juxtaposition there. Power, strength, as well as gentleness um, to rule the nations. Listen again to these words from Isaiah. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. Now, if I was Paula Rothlow or Christiane Rushton, I would break out into song and sing those lines for you. <laughs> but I'm going to spare you that. <clears throat> Isaiah paints a picture of peace that's composed of both strength and gentleness. But how far from reality that seems in our present world, don't you agree? It's torn by more wars around the world than it has been, I think, since any time since the Second World War. In many parts of the world, life has become unbearably grim and frightening and terrifying. Here, tucked away in this peaceful corner, one of the most beautiful places in the world, how are we meant to respond? When I came across a story in the weekly roundup of Baptist News Global, which you sometimes hear me quote, I came, I decided that I'd share it. The editor of Baptist News Global, who was a pastor in earlier life, still does lots of funerals, and he often shares in the Friday Roundup from those experiences. And last Friday, he presided over the memorial service of a saint in his church in Texas. In his words, Wanda was a force to be reckoned with, usually in a delightful way. Her love for family was legendary, as was her commitment to her pastor. Everybody take note. <laughs> After her retirement, Wanda found her calling as a greeter and usher at church. So, Pro Baptist uh, ushers and greeters take special note here. Listen up. And at this point in his column, the editor lets a former chief usher tell the story. So I'm going to quote it as it's written, uh, because it's very well told, and you do get too few stories from me, so here's a secondhand story. Wanda not only was on time every Sunday, but she was always early, wandering up and down the aisles, greeting early birds and especially newcomers. It was her ministry. Wanda was also deeply committed and loyal to her pastor. I like that part. <laughs> That's no new story. One Sunday, after collecting the offering, I took the money to the office, and Wanda was in the hallway looking out the window at the parking lot, and she was clearly anxious about something. I asked her what the problem was, and she pointed at the pastor's designated parking spot and said, George has left his lights on. 
His battery will be dead when he gets out of the service. We need to let him know. I looked out the window, and yes, there was a car in the pastor's parking spot with the lights on. But I knew it wasn't George's because he had been uh, he had begun parking across the street at Hillside Village. I told her that's not his car, but she insisted it was, and she needed to tell him. I told her we'll have to wait because he's preaching right now. <coughs> Wanda still wanted to go tell him, but about that time the facilities man manager came in. I asked him to look out and verify that it was not George's car. That is not George's car. Wanda sighed and said, Phew, that's a relief. I said, yes, but that's someone else's car and they do have a dead battery. And she said, well, I can't worry about everyone. <laughs> As the editor points out, the story speaks to a reality we all know. We can't worry about everyone. And I would add, we can't address every crisis in the world. Perhaps that's why the daily news just seems to be so overwhelming at times, and why a lot of people say, including me, that they don't listen or watch or read the news anymore. Why some of us close our eyes and ears. We just can't worry about everyone. That's understandable. Yet, if we're going to follow the teaching and example of Jesus, we've got to care about more than ourselves. So we struggle to find that balance between worrying about every car with the lights on versus just the cars of our friends with the lights left on. So what's our personal and corporate responsibility? Well, to address our personal response to God's love and grace, Peter gives us this advice, as we heard earlier. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, that is, the coming of the Lord at the end of the age, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. Now we can unpack that some other time, although I would guess that most of us would know what peaceful lives should look like in our own lives. Corporately, I think we need to decide which cars with lights on we should worry about. One car we can worry about is our Christmas mission project that the deacons adopted for this season. I've written about it on the back of your bulletin, but I would encourage you to go further than that and check out the websites noted at the bottom. Now, they, they are kind of obliterated. I need next week all, um, because we've got those fancy bulletins and there's uh, you know, writing at the bottom, so I don't know if you can make it out. I'll include them up higher next week. On those websites, you'll see the pictures of some of the students at the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary in Beirut, Lebanon. Of course, there are many other worthwhile projects we could have chosen from. CBM has pages of them. But I've recommended this one in particular because I know something about the wide range of influence it has. Having met the principal and his wife at ABC, and because Mary Grace visited this work on a mission trip back in 2011. Now she was, and you can see in the bulletin, she was going to share a bit about her experiences this morning, but was just naturally not up to it. Hopefully she'll feel up to share a little bit next week. Now the information I'm going to share with you comes from, this website, from their website and the CBM website located right in the middle of one of the most volatile regions in the world. And I should mention that we chose this project before the Gaza War erupted. The Arab Baptist Theological Seminary has a mission of peacemaking in the region it serves. 
MENA, M-E-N-A, that's the acronym for Middle East and North Africa. And in the past two years, they've hosted international consultations on peacemaking. The consultations began in 2022, focusing on the different theories and theologies of being peacemakers, while this year's had more to do with the how. Between the two consultations, they also had a mini conference where nine leaders from five countries, and those five countries were Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, and Sudan. Now just think about that. These are Christian pastors from those countries who came to ABTS to receive training on how they might implement peacemaking on the ground in their respective countries and in their own contexts. They've identified several layers or levels of peace, national, intergroup, interpersonal, inner, and something they call peace from the margins. Peacemaking and peace building that begins at any level will naturally affect the other levels because nations and groups are made up of persons with their own inner lives and interpersonal relationships. Lack of wholeness at any level can um, seep in, but it can also provide opportunities to seek reconciliation through God's grace toward healing in a renewed peace. This year's consultation was attended by 120 participants in person and then another 20 online from 16 countries. And then you can read more about it on the website and hear personal stories and testimonies, um, not only on the website but on their social media like Facebook and Instagram and others. And I've just had a brief look at them and have found some of the stories incredibly um, moving and inspirational. But on no, like that, I deliberately looked on none of the sites was there any reference to the war in Gaza, which is obviously for safety reasons. They just cannot risk that. I mentioned our Christmas project a mission project in the article I read, wrote for the Canning Gazette. Uh, I don't know, I think it may come up next week. I just made a mention of it in the list of things, just like on the back of the bulletin. And I wondered what public reaction might be. I was just a little nervous about including it because people have taken very strong sides in this Gaza conflict. So, I called our Atlantic rep for CBM, Randy Stanton, some of you might have met him, and he was most helpful and reassuring. He told me that the pastors who are trained at the seminary come from throughout the Arab-speaking world and are trained in loving and serving their neighbors, so are so sowing seeds of peace throughout Mina. Randy said they're the sort of people who will cross the street to shake hands with Muslim, Jewish, or others, regardless of their ethnic or religious background. So, this is just a, sort of a little heads up. If anyone speaks to you about it, you'll have this information to share with them. And I've written, as I've written on the back of the bulletin, the challenge is that most students can't afford the total tuition or residency fees. But we, here in this little corner of the world, have the privilege of helping to support one of these students. For a donation of $5 or more, you can place a beautiful gold star, thank you Amy for your creativity in making those, on the tree out there in Cherry Hall, in memory or honor of someone special in your life. Of course, nothing prevents you from giving more than $5 if you wish. And there's a jar, oh, maybe I forgot to put that out. I'll dash out after the service and put out the jar. There should be a jar next to the tree. Or you can also give through your offering envelopes, just marking it clearly for MENA, M-E-N-A. 
In this simple but meaningful way, Parole Baptist Church will care about the car whose lights are on in Nina. We might never have any way of knowing how profound a difference one student might make in their region, but we will be contributing to peacemaking on the world stage. There's a lovely verse in the book of Daniel that states, those who, who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead men to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. And I hope that we will be able to fill our tree with stars of peace this, this fall or this season. Amen. our church has been able to deliver over the past year, such as breakfast, pie sales, suppers, study groups, rooted youth, and Christmas tea. We pray for these type of events to continue in 2024. As we approach the Christmas season, we pray it will be a blessing to all, and most especially the children. As we take the bread, we remember that it signifies the body of Christ that was given so that we may have the hope of eternal life. Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, let us eat this bread as we remember Christ's sacrifice and reflect on what it meant, what it means for us. And just peel the top part off and the wafers. So, the bread of blessing. In 
the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. For as often as you drink, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he returns. Let us, let us again give thanks and be the following. Let us give thanks for the cup. Let us pray. Lord, you call us to be in constant communion with you, to find you in the midst of our cluttered lives, and to ask for your guidance. At times, that's hard to do, a hard thing to do, especially when the pressures of everyday life overwhelm us and work to push you out. Help us to remember the goal that you set for us, to talk with you about every aspect of our life and to share our thoughts and feelings with you. And then maybe the hardest part, to listen to your voice and follow your lead. God, as we commune with you here and now by drinking this cup, we focus on the commitment that you made to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We remember your sacrifice and reaffirm our commitment to you, share with you, and listen to you every day of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink this in remembrance of that Christ's blood was shed for us, and let's be thankful. The cup of hope.
if any of both the children have questions about what we just did, I'd be happy to answer questions, or I hope you'll ask the, those who might be able to give you the answers. Receive now the blessing. And this is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. May God, the source of hope, fill, fill you with joy and peace through your faith in him. Then you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 